Hello and welcome to Cinema to the Letter. This episode, it's the egregious film known as Van Helsing. On Cinema to the Letter, we break down the very nature of cinema letter by letter. For each episode of a film miniseries topic, we cover six films that fit a C for a classic, I for an indie, N for new, E for egregious, M for masterpiece, and A for atypical. Who doesn't love an acronym, am I right? I am Thomas, and I have no heart! I have no soul! (laughs) Um, I was gonna do that one. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> hi, I'm Brian, and my children live. <laughs> Perfect. Beautiful. Is that the, did, was that? Is did you do the one that he does at the beginning, where he does like the whole like monologue? Is that what that's from? That's from the bit when he talks to the two brides who are just like, oh, they uh, they might they've died. It's like, no, but your children. Do you have no heart? He has no heart. Of course was, he doesn't. I wanted to do in like the the opening the black and white section he does like the monologue where he ends it when he's like i am hollow (laughs) (laughs) i think we can both say this right now before we even get into the movie officially richard roxburgh mvp (laughs) what a performance (laughs) wonderful performance we need to talk about him truly a a goat dracula (laughs) (laughs) the best dracula like fuck bill lugosi gary oldman (laughs) all just terrible yeah you can't compete with this dracula uh, but welcome, everyone, to Cinema of the Letter. You know, for every mini series that we're planning on doing, uh, we have a spot reserved for that E for Egregious, because, you know, with the history of this feed, when I did Double Edge, Double Bill, I covered a bad movie every single week we did that show, and that became so exhausting. But I still wanted to cover at least one bad movie in a mini series, and we kind of agreed on it. Like, it's, you know, as much as we love movies, it's fun to talk about a bad movie when it's at least interesting yeah especially this movie this is an interesting movie <laughs> in yes, a lot of ways it is. yes uh, but what do you think like makes for a bad blockbuster we're in our blockbuster miniseries here and that's why we're covering van helsing so what exactly like f- makes a bad blockbuster in your opinion is it, like one specific mode is it different things what what's crucial for a blockbuster to be bad to you <sighs> there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff i think as we get like especially with this movie i think bad cgi is such a like you know such a a hallmark of a bad blockbuster the tone that this movie has and the vibe that it has and like it's 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 jokes and it's humor is so just kind of reeks of that like bad blockbuster that like i mean the writing in this movie is so i wrote down some some really great lines that i thought were really funny but i think that like especially cements it as like of this time of the early 2000s i think those things really are indicators of how of a bad blockbuster in in, during this time yeah but i think even as time has progressed i think there's been different flavors of like a bad blockbuster where i'll give you right now i think the the franchise that best describes sort of like the downfall of the modern blockbuster to me is men in black um i love the original men in black so much i've talked about it on this feed various times um and then men in black 2 is like the key example of a sequel i just sort of blockbuster where it's like let's just do everything we did previously and have like very vague changes but not really anything substantial and then men in black 3 which is like fine but i think it's like the epitome to me of a forgettable blockbuster um, where there's like there's fun stuff in there. I also have some big problems, particularly the ending of that movie. But that one at least feels like the most indicative of, especially that like that 2012 era. Like, oh whatever, this is like fine. It's not terrible, but I'm not going to remember it very much. And then Men in Black International, which is like the epitome of everything I hate about like a modern blockbuster sort of reboot thing, where it's like we're going to kind of have some of the iconography, but also we're going to change things up in a way that feels like several different script drafts and put you, uh, some talented people and give them little to do. 
and then also have an entire character, in that case it's the Kumail Nanjiani uh, alien guy, who just feels like this was added in, like, a month before this movie came out. <laughs> and, like, this barely has anything to do with anything that's going on. Yeah, I, I will say, I, like, Men in Black was, a, like, a weird, like, the first and second movie, at least. I, like, I grew up, like, it was on TV all the time. I have yes. never seen the full, like, fully Men in Black 2 or 3 but I maybe I should maybe I should go back. I've heard I've heard how like notoriously bad Men in Black Two is, so I've never seen it. But maybe I should should dive into that. Notice he did not say international. I don't blame you for saying no. I have not. I'm gonna be honest. You said Men in Black Two and Three, and I was like, yeah, that's the that's the only ones they made, right? And then I remembered that International <laughs> was like a real movie. <laughs> <laughs> yep, a real movie that they spent money on. Yeah, directed by F. Gary Gray, right? <laughs> Right, that's true. And I, I'll say this also, at least with those three movies, those are all examples where they're all bad movies, but the various ways they go wrong, and especially the production stuff on those movies, is fascinating to talk about. And sadly with this movie, I couldn't find much. I, I put together notes, everybody, for like the show, some show notes, and I tried to find production stuff, but this definitely feels like a movie, Van Helsing, 2004, that like... <laughs> They want you to forget about it. <laughs> like, no, yeah. that didn't happen. What are you talking about? We didn't do that. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is such a like instantly, almost like in one year out the other type of movie. And there, there are a lot of things I like about this movie. I will say, like while watching it, I found a lot of because I this was when I this was the only movie that we are covering in this in this uh, like a season or or whatever. Um, that I hadn't seen. Right. Um, and, and so while watching it, I, there's parts I like about it. <laughs> but as a whole, I mean, there's a reason why we're talking about this in the yeah. egregious section. <laughs> we'll talk about it for sure. So let's, uh, let's have the trailer play now for the Helsing. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. My life. My job. My curse is to vanquish evil. It is a place where nightmares come to life. He's the first one to kill a vampire in over a hundred years. I'd say that sent him a drink. Now, a man without a past. Do you have any family, Mr. Van Helsing? I hope to find out someday it's what keeps me going. Will face an enemy that never dies and uncover a secret he never imagined. Castle Dracula. Hello, Gabriel. We have such history, you and I. How do you know me? From the director of The Mummy and The Mummy Returns. Oh my God. Hugh Jackman. Kate Beckinsale. How do I kill him? No one knows how to kill Dracula. If you're late, run like hell. Don't be late. Van Helsing, a film by Stephen Summers. So Van Helsing came out May 7th, 2004, kicking off the summer movie season. Yeah, great start to the summer. <laughs> yep, for sure. Um, from writer-director Stephen Summers, who was an interesting name in terms of especially like the blockbuster sphere, because uh, Stephen Summers before this probably most famously had directed the two mummy films with Brendan Fraser. Um, you know, a universal production that involved them taking some characters they had used in the past, in the old Universal Monster era, and doing a new version of it. And it was, you know, it was really fun. The the, the oh, yeah. Brendan Fraser one. And especially, I say this as someone who does not have, like, intense nostalgia for it. I watched it for the first time right before the Tom Cruise Mummy came out. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I watched it for the yeah. first time, like, uh, last year, I guess, while Brendan was having his whole, like, awards run. For playing, right, uh, the whale... Pyacon from Avatar The Way of Water. <laughs> That's what he won that for. That's what's engraved on God. That. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I never really had like any nostalgia for the for the mummy. It reminded me of like the National Treasure kind of movies where it's like people kinda like him in like a novelty kind of way. But then I watched it and I was like, this thing fucking rules. And like Fraser and Rachel Weiss have the greatest chemistry that anyone's ever had in a in mm -hmm. a movie. Um, <laughs> yes. And like you know, visually, I think that movie look looks really great. 
I would posit I think The Mummy is, like, of the various attempts people have done since 1981 to do an Indiana Jones ripoff, it is, like, the best one, easily. Yes, yeah, 100%. The Mummy, and The Mummy Returns, which I you don't like. <laughs> no, I don't. I do not like that movie, no. <laughs> I just watched it, like, for the first time uh, for this, because, you know, we're talking, we're talking summers. It's a summer, it's a summer's summer. Um, summer movie season. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, even like, yeah, I think that that movie has a lot of fun elements to it as well. I mean, it's no Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. Like, that is like the bottom that, of the barrel. Yeah, that one I have not seen yet. I, I might dig into it, but I'm I'm not sure I want to. <laughs> yeah, especially because, you know, that one was not directed by Summers. And even as much as I do not like The Mummy Returns that much, you miss it immediately the moment like frame one of tomb of the dragon emperor right down to i'm sure he would have done a much better job of shooting a fight scene between jet lee and michelle gyo sounds great right but rob cohen cuts it to shit and yeah. it's bad yeah and like summers is a is a pretty good director i think i mean he's he's not, he's pretty good he knows where to put the camera but i don't think he's a good writer is the problem, mm-hmm. I think. Because um, he gets solo writing and directing credits on on Van Helsing. Right. Which is yes. kind of crazy. Because, you know, you, you always figure with, like, these really major, like, what did this movie cost? Like, 150 160 Uh This movie had a budget of $170 million. That's a lot of money. <laughs> and it made yeah. $300 million, which I think makes it, Jesus. like, the key example of one of these movies where, like, when this had come, I should mention, like, my history with Van Helsing yeah. is that I saw this in the theater. Because keep in mind, I would have been 12. So in theory, the perfect audience for this movie. Right, yeah. <laughs> Especially at that point, I'm, like, not as much in my scaredy pants mode. I'm actually, like, getting into horror movies. So I'm like, oh, a horror action movie starring Wolverine? This has got to be dope. Um, And that was a very, not the first, but one of the early examples of, like, Oh yeah, movies can be bad, and it's really <laughs> rough. Um, but but yeah, because like to go back a bit to Summers, I, I should note I watched a bunch of Stephen Summers movies, including ones right. I hadn't seen before. Like earlier today, I was watching a couple, and he I do agree with you. I think he's a very good director, especially at like kind of like boilerplate sort of like fun action, like blockbuster stuff. Because um, his first movie is Catch Me If You Can. No. Not yeah, I was really not confused when I saw that on his IMDb page. No, um, it's not at all about the Frag Abagnale story. It's actually a high school movie that takes place in the '80s, but it's very nostalgic for like drift race movies from before um, in the oh, '50s. Okay. It's very much a '80s nostalgic for the '50s movie, and there's a lot of fun stuff in it. Where like the premise is the bad boy in school does drag racing, and the preppy like um, <laughs> high school like person who like runs the committee to like try and save the school because it's going to be closed down. He like, instead of detention, the principal puts him into that and the two of them like bicker with each other. They don't like each other very much. And then he's like, you know what? I know how we can save the school. Let's bid on a race. And so they take all the money that they've like donated for the school, gotten from various people to do a drag race, bet it on him. Uh, he loses that race, and then they go back to M. Emmett Walsh, who plays the guy who, like, runs the oh, whole thing. Yeah. Um, and he's like, oh, you know what? Fine. Yeah, you want to double or nothing? Sure, I'll do it. And the drag racing's fun. There's a lot of, like, fun back and forth. It feels very reminiscent of, like, the uh, Brendan Fraser, Rachel Weiss sort of back and forth, like an early example of it. And it's, like, a solid, like, low-budget movie, which is why I get how from here he did stuff like The Adventures of Huck Finn starring baby Elijah Wood. And then uh, the Jungle Book, the initial Jungle Book from 94. Uh, right, which is still Disney-produced, right? Both of those are Disney-produced. Okay. Um, yeah, so they kind of bring him in to do, like, some solid B-level stuff. Um, uh, watching both of those, uh, the Jungle Book is interesting in that it's, like, it's more of a Tarzan movie. Oh, right, because the kid's grown up. Right, yes. They, they grow him up. Um, he's played by Jason Scott Lee. You know, he goes back to society, and they train him to, like, speak English. You know, it's Tarzan. But the big thing is they had actual real animals for the most part. There's, like, barely any, like, animatronics. And so it's a lot of situations where you're kind of like, oh, did, did a nope happen? And Disney covered that up. There's, like, 50-something different animals that show up there. Jesus. Um, and are ma- interacting a lot with, like, the main cast and everything. Um, it's an interesting movie. Huck Finn is very much, um, it's an adaptation 
of the Mark Twain novel from the 90s. So it's a lot of just like, we kind of solved racism. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know if you did that. I don't know if Huckleberry Finn, Elijah Wood, and Courtney B. Vance, Jim, like really solved race <laughs> relations here <laughs> in the middle of all this. Um, then he does um, a movie I really love, Deep Rising, which is like, I told you about this. I don't know if you saw it. I, I didn't have a chance to see it, but I'll, I'll probably end up seeing it after this. Basic pitch, just, uh, it's about this group of, like, uh, you know, seafaring thievers, kind of like pirates, but in, like, the modern day. Um, yeah. The lead played by the late great Treat Williams, who's awesome. Um, and they, like, oh, we're, there's a big cruiser out here in the middle of the ocean. We're going to jump on board and try and, like, you know, steal stuff from all these rich people. Uh, turns out there's, like, a horrible giant tentacle monster on that boat <laughs> hell yeah real fun movie so good would recommend that to anybody out there but then yeah then the mummy mummy returns our van helsing as we'll be covering in detail um then the first gi joe movie a live action gi joe movie rise yep, of cobra the rise of cobra right um and then um a movie called odd thomas never heard of this in my life <laughs> I-, I did also watch this and as a fellow oh. odd thomas it's uh not <laughs> that great unfortunately it does star the late great anton yelchin who i yes. miss so much yeah this came out in 2013 willem dafoe's in it yep um he plays um like the basically the second lead of the movie um who you wish was in the movie more than the love interest who is rough <laughs> it's it's not it's not great i don't know but the point is uh that's his last movie that was 10 years ago so a very sort of truncated directorial career, even though he's got producer credits on, like, The Scorpion King or The Scorpion King sequels, the fucking four of them that have come out. <laughs> um, but but anyway, so um, I do agree with you that I think he's a much better director than he is a writer necessarily, but at the same time, you notice, I think, a big shift. I think it's, a, like, post The Mummy, where there's great digital effects in The Mummy. There's also great practical effects in The Mummy. Yeah. But he's doing, like, the meme where the guy's walking with the girl and there's the looking at the other girl. But it's, like, big CGI and, like, the shocked one is holding, he's holding hands with his, like, practical effects. Because, yeah. like, he gradually stops using, well, it doesn't stop. There, there's practical elements even in this movie. But um, they are obfuscated quite a bit by the CG. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, like, and the mummy feels like, the first mummy feels like such a great, like, kind of marriage of practical and CGI in a way where yes. like the CGI that is used in that movie is, you know, it, it is like kind of that nineties, two thousands CGI, but it, it, yeah, the, the practical elements of that movie, just like the sets, the production design and everything is, is really incredible. And I like some of the like sets in this. I mean, like in Van Helsing and in, even in the yes. mummy returns, the production design and also the costume design. Yes. Yeah. But yes, there is like a, a more of a reliance on CGI that I don't think the movie's all the better for. And like, it's funny because like you watch The Mummy and yeah, the CGI has like aged, but you know, because of the practical elements, it still looks good. I Watching Van Helsing, it was like so many of it has just not aged well. <laughs> no, no. Um, but you know, um, how about we give a plot synopsis? For this sure. movie, in case, you know, this is a long forgotten movie in many ways to a lot of people. I don't blame you. Um, but uh, <laughs> Van Helsing uh, stars the titular um, Gabriel Van Helsing, not Abraham, as he usually is, uh, played by Hugh Jackman, um, who in this universe is a guy that still hunts around monsters because he was in the original Dracula book. He was the guy that, like, killed Dracula in the original Bram Stoker novel and has been featured in various different media as, like, basically Dracula's nemesis. And so in this case, um, he hunts a bunch of monsters and his alliance is with uh, this weird secret society that meets out of the Vatican, um, yeah. who are like, you need to kill evil, um, as we see at the opening of this, uh, which has him chasing down uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Which I want to put a pause here because I also watched this, uh, another thing that dates this movie firmly in like 2004. Um, this had an animated short film prequel that was released on okay. DVD. Okay. Um, it, very similar to like Chronicles of Riddick had this, the Hellboy movies had this, like oh, these sure, movies sure. that were trying to appeal to dorks were like, Hey, here's an animated, like 30 minute prequel that tells you the story of like what happens right before. 
And that it's about like him chasing down Mr. Hyde and Dr. Jekyll. But he doesn't know that Mr. Hyde and Dr. Jekyll are the same guy yet. That little short, it's like, it's fine. It's like TV animation, basically. But the premise is way more interesting where he's hunting down Mr. Hyde because Mr. Hyde is, like, stealing souls out of people in London. And they make it explicit, like, oh, he's what people call Jack the Ripper. Which this movie kind of hints at at the beginning. Oh, but then does, does nothing it? with. <sighs> yeah. I, I felt that. Because you see, like, the hat and the coat that he finds and whatever. Oh, sure, 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 yeah, But yeah, they yeah. make that way more explicit in this animated short. And the reason he's, like, catching souls is so Dr. Jekyll can feed this to Queen Victoria... <laughs> And when she drinks it, she becomes younger. And then she also forgets that she's like, you know, seven years old. She just goes back mentally to like 20. And old ass Dr. Jekyll is like, I will keep you young and healthy forever if I become king of England. (laughs) That's amazing. That sounds really great. Why isn't that a movie? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that sounds so much more interesting than what actually happens here. Because, like, they treat him, they treat that section like, it's like the introduction of Van Helsing. It's his character introduction. It's like, we get to see him, like, on a mission for the first time, you know. Yeah, I missed, like, all of, none of that is, like, in the movie at all. (laughs) No, not at all. It's not there because it's just like, oh, I'm chasing after somebody. Turns out it's Mr. Hyde, voiced by Robbie Coltrane. Um, And uh, he... (laughs) I knew this movie, like, when I, because I hadn't seen this since the theater. It had been so long. Oh, And I had, like, the the detail that made me realize, like, oh, yeah, this is going to be rough to revisit, is there's a point during the big action sequence where Mr. Hyde's trying to get him. Like, they have a shot of Mr. Hyde's backside, and you can see his ass crack. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Which (laughs) felt both, like, um, a bit harbinger of doom, but also, like, a clear executive note post shrek coming out yep Mm -hmm. that because he kind of looks like shrek and he also just like if i could see some guy with a cigar being like yeah you gotta put the ass crack and that's what the kids like now (laughs) it'll make the kids laugh (laughs) where's all star can we get that in here god but yeah this opening sequence happens he faces off against um uh, mr hyde and you know this is a cool version of ben helsing where like he's got uh, a hat on that makes him kind of look like Vampire Hunter D, the anime. Um, yeah. <laughs> and he's got, like, a mask all over, like, half his face. And he's, like, shooting crossbows, dual wielding and stuff. Um, so he defeats Mr. Hyde. And everyone is like, oh, you shot this innocent man. Because he turns into Dr. Jekyll as he's falling. And right. it's like, curse you, Van Helsing! <laughs> well, you forgot like, to mention, by the way, that they fight at the the Notre Dame. <laughs> Yes, right. And he throws him yes. through, like, the window of, like, the, the, st- the stained glass window of the Notre Dame. And they have, like, a whole, like, grappling hook thing that's going on. It's very bleh. Um, right. It's not a good he, action sequence. Yes. No. Yeah. And then he goes to, like, see his, like, handler at the Vatican, which is is kind of cool. Like, a secret, like, Vatican organization that's, like, hunting these monsters. But, like... None of that is, like, expanded on, really, in this. No, all. also, a very confusing moment is in the middle of that, there's a point where, um, during the sequence, he, like, meets up with his, you know, his chief of police, this uh, cardinal, just like, God damn it, Van Helsing, you're off the force. <laughs> yeah. I can't handle this. Um, and then he meets up with his sidekick, Carl, played by David Wenham, which I love that, just a friar named Carl. <laughs> just... <laughs> but yeah. a poor name but um they there's a point like during that where like uh carl's showing off like the various q gadgets he's invented for van helsing and he throws like an explosive thing over and there's a guy who adr'd in his line is like oh what in the name of allah is wrong with you so it's like wait so are there like multiple different religious forces that are in the vatican thing right <laughs> what what's going on what's happening here yeah but, he is really he is like a q type figure almost like the like yeah it is part of like what like they're trying to make Van Helsing like cool where they give him like gadgets and he's got like all this like you know arsenal that he can use and i love david wenham but this this role is just <laughs> kind of nothing i will say this much i don't think anyone is quite sleepwalking um in this movie necessarily no cuz like you know you got like Hugh Jackman who like this is like peak like Right after X2. Can we talk some Jackman? Yes. I mean, I think Jackman is a very interesting actor in that 
he burst on the screen obviously with like Wolverine. He was like such an unknown. Yeah. Um, and it was less like, oh, who is this like Australian actor? So fascinating. And then you find out he's like big into like Broadway musical performing <laughs> yeah. and stuff like that. It's like, oh, that's fun. That's great. And I still think like for whatever like Hugh Jackman has been in some terrible fucking movies. Like rough, yeah. bad movies. Yeah, he really has. But then, like every time even I see a bad movie of his, he either does his smile or his Wolverine frown. And I'm like, oh, but that guy's pretty cool. He's yeah. good. He's like he's really good. He has a really interesting like 2000s where he's like making the X Men movies. You know, is is making he's working with like interesting directors. Like he makes a movie with Darren Aronofsky. Uh, All right, and Christopher Nolan in the and, same yeah, year. I believe the same That's year, the... which is a really interesting. Yeah, like the Prestige and the Fountain. Um, in 2006, he also had, he's got a really big 2006. That's Last Stand as well, right? That is. I wasn't thinking of that in any way. <laughs> no, no, of course not. <laughs> no one was. <laughs> um, but he is in a movie that we all know and love, uh, Flushed Away. <laughs> oh, um, <Yeah. laughs> and he's also in Happy Feet, which like is like weird, but also it's like, well, it's probably him wanting to work with like George Miller, which like, right. you know? You know, Aussie um, stay strong. There's a, there's a couple Aussies in, in Van Helsing. As well, as well, <laughs> detail because Wenham's also an Australian, right? And then, I um, so. and Roxburg is also Australian. Is he? Because he's, he's in a bunch of fucking Baz Luhrmann movies, like he was just in Elvis. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and like, and so, Hugh Jackman does a, he does, he does the Australian movie for Baz Luhrmann. <laughs> Australia. That's true. The, the one, um, Baz Luhrmann project I have not seen any of because I'm like, I don't know. I'll get to that at some point. I guess <sighs> they're, they're doing that Hulu. Like recut, right? Of a mini series. Yeah, he was talking about how he's editing like a mini series for something. I mean, it's like already three hours long, and like, it's not that good. I barely remember it. It's uh, it's like by far his worst movie. But like again, it's it stars Hugh Jackman and Nicole Kidman, and I'm sure they're both like good from what I can remember of that movie. But um, yeah, he he's such a he's a great actor, and he. Yeah, it's funny, like, yeah, he starts out making, like, as Wolverine, and then he's like, but I just want to sing and dance in movies now. And you know what, good on him, you know, I'm all good for that. Maybe yeah. that was good with him weirdly being friends with Jared Kushner, which I remembered recently, like, oh yeah, that's a thing. Really? Hmm. Like, him and, Av him and Ivanka are buddies from way back, evidently. But it's, he, like, there was some USA Today thing where he was talking about this, like, around, like, 2017, and he's like, oh, we don't discuss politics at our parties, like, mm-hmm. Here, Hugh. Oh, right. Hugh. Right. Hugh. Uh, but still, fun actor. Love seeing him in things, you know. And, and even in this movie, you can tell this is so much like a vehicle built around, like, we want to give the guy who does Wolverine another, like, franchise. We, like, he'll be great. Very key, especially to the plot of this movie, with what <laughs> Van Helsing <laughs> ends up becoming, as it were. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, the, just to kind of like wrap up the plot sub synopsis. So basically the mission he's given at the beginning of the movie is there was a bit of a prelude we forgot to talk about. That was like the yes, prologue that, that was uh, black and white, um, and stuff. But basically that details that like, um, over in Transylvania, Dracula himself, the Count, um, has taken over basically after, um, there's a whole thing with Dr. Frankenstein being killed and the f creature Frankenstein's monster going missing and stuff, and so now Dracula's taken over, and there's a whole thing where he's trying to kill off this family that has been hunting him down over there, who have, like, a treaty with the Vatican Society. Um, and all, all that's left now is a brother and a sister, uh, the sister being played by Kate Beckinsale, who is our female lead of the movie. So, Van Helsing and David Wenham, Carl, I'm sorry, <laughs> Carl, I'll call him by the name his mother gave him, Carl, um, <laughs> go over to Transylvania, where they have to try and face off against not just uh, Dracula, but also his three brides and the army of children they are trying to procreate <laughs> with the assistance of um, Igor, um, who's played by Kevin J. O'Connor of Benny fame from The Mummy, which is, you can't recognize him. Like, the makeup is, like, <laughs> it's weird where I think it looks like, oh, this is, like, a solid version of, like, what an Igor would look like, but it constricts Kevin J. O'Connor, who's a very good actor. In yeah. like this, or like in There Will Be Blood when he shows That's up. That's what I associate like him actor. with. Yeah. Right. Uh, but this, he's just like, he can't move in that fucking makeup. <laughs> no. Yeah. I like barely, I barely recognize that it was him. You can kind of tell because of his eyes. He's got like kind of distinctive eyes, but yeah, he's not. No. Um, <laughs> I, I will say to go back to that like opening section with the kind of uh, the black and white, I, I do 
really like that section. I think it starts the movie off on a really good foot. Well, especially as like something that's trying to like do a universal monsters reboot of sorts. Um, it fits appropriately, and it looks genuine. Like it's the best the movie kind of looks, quite frankly. It, it is, yeah. It's like this the really stark like contrast. I, lo- I mean, I'm about to change my zoom background to like the great like universal on fire like logo, which is so great. Um, yes. Yeah, like I really like that section, but yeah, the rest of the movie just doesn't. He also like drags Carl along with him. He's like, "You're coming with me," and Carl's like. I don't wanna. And he's like, I don't care. Let's go. <laughs> right. They don't. There's a lot of this movie where um, I have notes that I prepared for this. I've been doing notes for this show. Um, after a certain point, it just becomes a lot of why questions. Like, <laughs> why is this happening? Why are we going here? Why is this character here in the scene? And I guess it feels like I'll say this much: like Stephen Summers, very openly, even in his bad movies, is trying to entertain. He feels very consummate as like a sort of entertaining director. And you can tell also that he really likes even, like, the old Universal Monster movies. You can tell that, like, he has an appreciation for, like, these characters. And I would love a fun monster mashing movie that's just, like, oh, Van Helsing. And Van Helsing's a good, like, there's a good, like, premise here of, like, Van Helsing's going around hunting a bunch of monsters. That's the way you should do a dark universe, (laughs) as you could say. (laughs) Yeah, I really like the, like, the sort of base premise of... Dracula's the big bad. He's got all these, you know, these underlings, right? You, he's he's got like Frankenstein, Frankenstein working for him, and all and whatever. Just to briefly mention, like, yeah, he has like an army of like little cloth, like Jawas, essentially. They're like, yeah, I I referred to them as um like steampunk Jawas, is <laughs> yeah, what they remind me accurate. of. <laughs> yeah. Right, who are just these creatures that like they give a name to. It's like the Dowaji or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. And they give no other explanation to like, <laughs> wait, I don't remember. Like, this, this isn't part of lore. Like, as a Universal Monsters fan, uh, this was never in the lore. But even then, just like, I don't know. How does he have minions? <laughs> where, where did he get these minions from? They couldn't just have like, if you had had even just like bat guys going around, like bat minions, I'd get that. I'd get that Dracula has a, a, a crude, like a, a gang of vampires. To be his, like, minions, sure, but instead they go with these things and Igor. Do they live in Transylvania? Like, are they, are they like, residents of Transylvania? Like, what's, I don't, I, I'm, what, what's the story with them? <laughs> Speaking of Transylvania as a place, I, like, could think of is, like, Transylvania must be so dangerous to live in <laughs> with Dracula living, like, right there. Like, it's, it's like Gotham City. I mean, I mean, that's kind of the thing in the old Universal Monster movies, which I know you haven't seen. No, that, I miss right? them every time like Criterion Channel does the like Universal Monsters like thing. I, I miss it every time. I mean, what I like in those movies, which was the original cinematic universe, as many people <laughs> like to talk about, um, in those movies, Transylvania is just depicted as like a bunch of people in like Lederhosen and like very German who like whenever anybody comes up, just like I'm going up to Castle Dracula. <gasps> You're doomed. Don't go. <laughs> and they get like some Hungarian guy to say like that kind of shit. Um, and it's in every single movie. And the entire time, you're just like, why don't you guys leave? This seems like a terrible place to live. <laughs> Dracula's so close, and he's gonna feed. But I do, I do, I will say, I like that one. One of the few bits I really liked in this movie is the bit where, like, after the big fight happens in the Transylvanian courtyard, with the brides coming in, and like Kate Beckinsale and Hugh Jackman meet each other, all this other stuff. After that whole sequence, there's the one bit where the guy who's, like, the Undertaker um, comes up and says, Oh, now you've really pissed him off. Like, he just came by and picked off a couple guys, usually. And we were, like, fine with that. And now you're fucking that up. He's going to seek revenge against us. Yeah, he's like, we we didn't even like those those guys anyways that he took took with him. Like, we were going to let him have them, but... (laughs) But now you had to fucking stir the pot, Van Helsing. Yeah. Um, And and the thing is, that sequence also, um, it's a big... microcosm of like the stuff that works in the movie and stuff that doesn't the costuming and everybody Kate Beckinsale Hugh Jackman like it all looks good even like the villagers and also the set design for like this movie was shot mostly in Prague and like the outdoor sets they do for like the houses and how decrepit they are and how like ancient it looks like a solid like yeah this is like a big movie set this is fun uh and then the Brides of Dracula show up and, like, the heads are practical, because I watched a behind-the-scenes thing. From neck upward, they are all made up like that. And the makeup looks pretty good. The design of what it they does, look yeah. like looks pretty good. Uh, but then they're on CG bodies, and it's so rough. <laughs> yeah. They do, like, it's right when they're, like, on the way to Transylvania. They're the, they do, like, a, like, 
Lord of the Rings style. Like you see them like a, a wide shot of them on like horses and it like pans over to like, I guess, Transylvania. And that's like l- the landscapes look like really great and mm-hmm. are like really beautiful. But then, yeah, the CGI, the, br- the brides are really interesting. <laughs> Like, I will also say during this like sequence, he gets a a great like crossbow that has like a, a huge right. like thing. He's not even aiming with it. He's just like spitting. He's just like spraying everywhere like bolts. I'm like <laughs> machine Helsing, gunning it. <laughs> yeah, I'm like Van Helsing. You're a vamp. You're a, you're like this is your job. You should be better at this. Well, hey, excuse me. We forgot one key part of his backstory, which he doesn't remember anything. It isn't when he goes to see his handler at the Vatican, isn't he promising him to, like, bring his memory back or something? Right, it's it's something much like, I have to earn back my memories or some yeah, shit like that. Yeah, but it's also, like, they never go back to that in terms of, like, the Vatican. No, they only go back to it because, like, they reveal later on, like, the, the shocking reveal for audiences is that Van Helsing used to hunt down Count Dracula <laughs> yeah. before, but, like, hundreds of years ago. And it's like, oh, okay, so he keeps living. Almost the movie... I kind of got this. I don't know if this was what they had planned, maybe, because of his first name being Gabriel now. Are they implying he's, like, the angel Gabriel to, like, fit the religious theme? Because it feels like at least that's an illusion they're making. Yeah. Huh. I did keep calling him, like, Gabe <laughs> during while Gabe. I was watching the. <laughs> the Mummy Returns has a lot of, like, religious stuff going on. So, I don't know. Maybe, yeah, maybe Stephen Summers is just really into religion um maybe that's a secret this next film's gonna be for pure flicks it's like oh no (laughs) (laughs) it's a monster movie about jesus it's just like oh the creature from the black lagoon (laughs) is gonna tell you about the the word of christ uh i don't know maybe um so this like big sequence happens we're not gonna go through plot beat by plot beat but um i i want to just talk about this point now that we're in transylvania the domain of dracula we gotta talk about richie Richie Roxburgh, <laughs> Richie Roxburgh in this movie as Count Dracula. Um, as much as I, like I said, I don't think anyone's sleepwalking through this movie. Um, Richard Roxburgh is at full attention. He is <laughs> He's... really sinking his teeth into everything. And I think it's part of a big run of his. Because I've, I've always noted this because of the way I found out about this guy. Was realizing he was in a bunch of villainous roles in big movies from the dawn of the new millennium. So you got... In um, Mission Impossible 2, right, he plays yeah. the number two uh, guy who at one point Tom Cruise is disguised as. There's that great shot of him like running down and taking off the mask and he's Tom Cruise. Yeah. Um, and there's that. There's Moulin Rouge, which I think he's amazing in. He plays the main villain who, like, he manages to be both extremely menacing but also as comedic as, like, a late night with Conan O'Brien character because he's very <laughs> silly in that movie. But like, he's very solid at it. And then... Um, Right before this was The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, where he played the main villain. Which, right. have you seen that movie? I've No, I haven't seen it, but I, I've heard of its kind of... I've heard it's, it's famously bad, is what I've heard, but I've, I've never seen it's it. It's very bad. I would agree with that. It's, <laughs> it's not a good movie, but it fits very much as, like, a twin to this movie. Those movies have a very similar aesthetic... And also, like, similar cast members. But even, like, that one is about, like... Because it's based on the Alan Moore comic series. And it's about, like, a bunch of the uh, sort of literary figures coming together to form an Avengers. Like, the Invisible Man. Um, Tom Sawyer is uh, one Nemo. of... Captain <laughs> Nemo. Captain From... Nemo, yes. Yeah, and Alan Quartermain, who's Sean Connery in his last live-action appearance in the movie. <laughs> um, that one's also, that one's fascinating. Uh, but it's it has a similar... Like, a lot of similarities with this one. I think they both feel very indicative of, like... The trying to catch up with, like, this specific era of blockbusters. Because the big movies right now are, like, your X-Men's, your Spider-Man's, which have recently come out. Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl has come out. So that kind of era of blockbusters. And this movie and League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, like, really feel like they're trying to chase that tail. Right. Back to Roxburgh, who is yeah. so great. Like, talk. <laughs> like, do you agree with, like, he is the MVP of this movie, right? He yeah he kind of is just because he's giving a very big performance, <laughs> and just every yes. delivery he gives is just so ridiculous and like just so f- he it, it, he's having a very fun time with it, and, and like I want to be in the movie that he's in because yes. that movie seems very fun and very lighthearted and very just silly, whereas the actual movie where you you watch is 
just not that. It, the vibe is kind of off. But he's so fun, and he has so many lines that I just like. I couldn't keep, write all of them down because he just has so so many of them. <laughs> um, he's the best part of this movie, I would say. Yeah. For another thing, also a great visual touch I really liked is how there are certain moments where because Dracula in this universe can like walk up walls basically and has no real like his sense of gravity shifts with where he walks basically. I love how many shots there are where like there's a point where Igor is like trying to turn on the Frankenstein machines and. He's, like, standing at a weird, like, 45-degree angle from, like, yeah. the top corner. Like, that shit's cool. I like yeah. that. He's just like, I just walk where I please all <laughs> over the place. Yeah, that that's fun. And, like, we should also talk about, I guess, the other lead of this movie, Kate Beckinsale. Yes, um, Kate Beckinsale. Who we all know from Adam Sandler's Click, right? Yes, right. <laughs> This is her performance in this. Like, yeah, she's not like phoning it in at all. But I think this no. is such an indicative like era for blockbusters. For like, the female characters are just so poorly written and so underwritten. Yeah. And this is such a prime example of that. Where so like, yeah, you you mentioned uh, her and her brother are the last surviving members of like this family that's you know, a Dracula's hunting. But like, that's kind of the only character development she's given is that she like has a brother who gets kind right. of like he gets a uh, kind of kidnapped and like transformed into a werewolf by by dracula um, right especially when like the whole like thing with her she's supposed to be in theory be like an equal to van helsing and that's kind yeah. of the fun of it right is it's just yes. like oh they're like bickering back and forth with each other doesn't work out but then she like spends a solid like 25 minutes of the movie kidnapped and brought over to Dracula's place, and she can't escape on her own, so Van Helsing and Carl have to save her. <laughs> Just the way that, she, like, her character's written, and the way that, like, this was a time in Blockbusters where if you had any female character that, like, you know, the costume design had to be, like, so much cleavage on every female character yep. for no reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, like, yeah... It, I don't know. And I don't even think she's bad. I don't even, like, hate her character no. or anything. It's and she's done such a great job of hunting down monsters in the Underworld movies, which, like, yeah. uh, I'm guessing... You, have you seen those? I'm guessing no, you haven't. I've seen none of these. Um, yeah. How many are there? <laughs> there are five. Five. Um, I watched them recently. Honestly, like, you know what? I, I know the, the popular opinion is that the Resident Evil movies are underrated and Paul W. Sanderson's a master. And, like, whatever, I like some of those. They're, some of them are fun. But I think Underworld is the more underrated and consistent franchise, I would say. Okay. Uh, and none of them are great. Uh, I would say the best one is the third one, which is a really solid prequel. That's about, like, Michael Shannon's character and takes place a while before... Um, that one is very interesting. Also, I think Blood Wars, the most recent one, is fun. Uh, particularly, that one has a villain where at one point, the main villain of the movie is uh, she's talking to her uh, henchman and she like has him go down on her while she's delivering her evil plot. Cool. <laughs> it's it's pretty fun. It's just like, oh, this is like silly and wonderful. And I, yeah. I like those movies, even if they do, you know, they look very post-Matrix. They're very sure. blue. There's times where it's kind of rough to see things, um, but I think all of them, except the fourth one, are at least watchable. The fourth one's fucking bad. Really bad. Don't Awakening, it's called. Yep, that's the one that's just like, oh, this is what everyone sees when they think of these movies. But those movies know what they are, and they also like have a better reign on like what their visual style is. There's plenty of CG, but there's also like some practical like makeup effects and stuff that like really contrast in a decent way, not a great way. Um, as opposed to like this movie once again, where especially with Kate Beckinsale, like you mentioned, she just is like very flighty. Depending on the script, she'll like go to whatever, and that's a this movie is like so like Frankenstein together. Pardon the pun. Where like it just feels like there's big things that were deleted at some point in the production and then we gotta like oh let's tie this together very quickly like what we gotta talk about frankenstein this weird <laughs> use of frankenstein in this movie where he's played by a theater actor who's worked with hugh jackman a bit um he's uh surly hensley um and uh he's mostly known for theater and you can tell where he feels like kind of like the weird opposite version where like I think him and Richard Roxburgh are both playing to the rafters kind of thing in terms of like over the top right. but 
like with Mr. Hensley, um, it just feels like he's constantly wailing in pain. Yeah. And it's like, this ain't fucking fun, man. I like, I love Frankenstein. Like, this is just like kind of a sad, pathetic version of Frankenstein where he keeps saying like, I want to live. And every time it just seems like he's in pain. And I'm like, I would rather give him a mercy killing. He just doesn't seem like he really wants to stay alive because it's horrible for him. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, I'm jumping to the end, but like the, there's the end where he's like dangling off and Carl, our boy Carl is there to save him. And he's, you know, he's like, I want to live. And Carl just goes, all right. <laughs> and that's it. That's like, yeah. But, but how do you feel about this version of Frankenstein? <laughs> I love the design of him. Like, mm-hmm. I love, like, seeing, you can see his, like, heart. It looks like kind of like an, uh, like an oscilloscope, almost. Yes. Um, and, like, same with, like, his head. Yeah. And I like the idea of, like, put, like, putting him in this movie in this way where it's, like, yeah, like, Dracula needs Frankenstein's monster is the key. That part's a bit kind of, like, Okay, whatever. But right. like, he has to put Frankenstein like on the slab up when like the lightning happens, so that his babies won't die because his babies die like within twenty four hours, basically yeah. after they're born. So he's like, "You're the key to keeping my children alive because you came back to life." That part, that yeah, that part, I could leave that. But like, the idea of of incorporating like Frankenstein's monster in this way is like, okay, it's kind of interesting. But yeah, I, none of it. We should also mention, like, this movie is kind of long. It's two hours and 12 minutes. Yep. And it really feels long. But, but Frankenstein's monster, like, there's a part where someone, like, someone, I think it's Kate Beckinsale, screams, it's Frankenstein's monster. And they make, like, an effort to go to make sure they say it's Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> it's just... Yeah, because they don't want to be one of those, they don't want people complaining in the audience about, like, oh, he's that Frankenstein. Yeah. Frankenstein, the doctor's name. <laughs> Um, he's integrated, I think, in a weird way, where it just doesn't feel like he works as well with the plot. And also, there's a wolfman in this movie, as it turns out. Kate Beckinsale's brother is uh, the wolfman who was doing Dracula's bidding, and then at some point, like, dies horribly. And we're like, oh, we cared so much about this guy? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I... no. What was his name? Yeah, I'm like, when does he die? He dies in, like, the forest somewhere after, like, a, a chase or something. There, there's a whole sequence where, like, he tries to chase him down on, like, the, the horse and carriage and uh, oh, and right, all that. Yeah. And I think even from, there's an earlier point where they have a different werewolf. Because that's the thing is, like, the brother got bitten at, like, the very first scene that he's in. Yeah, He's yeah, bitten yeah. by a werewolf who's out there that they kill. And so, uh, right from that point, um, I would say of all the CG in this movie... The werewolves. Woof. <laughs> Pardon, pun intended. It deserves the pun. That terrible yeah. pun. It looks so bad. <laughs> it's really bad. Yeah, because they do this thing. They don't, because they do the, they don't do the typical, like, werewolf transformation from, like, a, a American werewolf from London. Or, and they don't also do, like, the old universal style where it'd be, like, uh, Lon Chaney Jr. sitting in a chair. Like, it would dissolve between all the effects that would build up. Right. They do, like, th- the skin their skin peels off and reveals the fur. But then when they transform back into people, the fur sheds and then the skin comes back. It it sounds weird and it doesn't make any sense. No. Yeah. It's it's very (laughs) odd. I mean, to be fair, there are other werewolf movies where that's been done. And I think that can be like a cool idea. Sure. Um, Especially there's a great movie called company of wolves, uh, where like the werewolves kind of like come out of the human, basically like out of their mouths. That sounds cool. Which is dope, right? Um, but here, like, in theory, I like the idea of, like, oh, ripping off the uh, skin. But does that mean that just, like, there's a lot of skin versions of, like, Hugh Jackman and, like, this other guy just, like, on the ground in other places? Just like, oh, my God, someone's been skinned alive. And their twin has two over here. Yeah. It makes no sense. And it's it, – because, it, like, when they first do it, it's, like, the it, – because it's the scene when they arrive and it's nighttime. Van Helsing, like – he like knocks her out. What's her What's her character's name? I'm already forgetting. Anna. Um, Anna. Yeah. He like knocks her out. Kind of a questionable move, but we'll move on. Um, <laughs> and like it, it's in yeah, it's the transformations in like the it. You see like the full moon. It, it's quite like striking in a way, but it just looks so goofy. <laughs> yeah, it looks really goofy. <laughs> yeah, and not in like a fun way either. Because I think the problem with this movie is that like. When it does have the humor, it's very much, like, one-liners that are just put in, like, haphazardly. Mm -hmm. Um, But then the movie, also just in general, like, when it's especially, like, Van Helsing 
and Carl and Anna. It's super serious, pretty much. Like, there's not a lot of levity there, really. No. But, and the few attempts are pretty bad. Like, there's the bit where Anna is, like, going over to Van Helsing, and it's like, oh, you drink the strong stuff? It's absinthe. Watch out. And she drinks it whole, like, oh, nice. Oh, no, we <laughs> fell into a cave! <laughs> and, like, that's... It, it's so, like, subpar Indiana Jones shit. Like, this feels like the much worse example of, like, trying to do an Indiana Jones style thing than the mummy <laughs> yeah and like i will say this so like hugh jackman and kate back and say all like with their like whole kind of relationship in the movie it would make sense because like stephen Sommers does like the the fraser and rachel weiss stuff in the, the two mummy movies that i've seen is like incredible like i think they have incredible chemistry like both of their characters are so well like fleshed out and well written and like none of that is translated in this movie. And I feel like it's because like, there's just so much that this movie has to do besides like their whole romance that they, yeah, it, it, that it just doesn't have time to focus on their romance, which is a, much easier in something like the mummy. Nor does it also have time to like actually make Van Helsing that interesting as like a hero character, because no. in theory you would want him to be Indiana Jones. And there's like, they do the worst attempt at that where there's a bit Kate Beckinsale's family has been living in this house that Dracula used to live in. And there's this mysterious map that's on the wall, and it's not complete. And they're like, we don't know where it leads, we don't know where it's... We know something has to be up with this map. And they, like, read, like, a sacred text that they find in the middle of the place, and they're like, oh, it's gotta be this. It's some kind of, like, maybe doorway. How are we gonna, like, put it together? And the way they do that is... Way back at the beginning of the movie, the Cardinal's like, oh, hey, bring this piece of paper with you, this parchment that's ripped oh, out. Oh, right, yeah. And then the Helsing's like, wait, what about that thing we were given at the beginning of the movie? <laughs> and then Carl puts it down there at the corner, and then a mirror suddenly pops up like it's fucking a Super Mario Brothers level that they're about to walk through. <laughs> and then um, they're like, oh, it's a mirror. And it's like, maybe it's not a mirror. And then Helsing just pushes through it, and they go through a portal to Dracula's castle that they can't find. Which admittedly, like, goes kind of hard. Like, the design for his, like, castle is kind of, like, super cool. Oh, the um, castle's amazing. Like, the, yeah. honestly, the section where, like, he, they had the big ball at a certain point, everyone's, like, yeah. dancing around and whatnot. I'm like, oh, this looks so fucking great and opulent. Like, I miss a blockbuster looking this giant. It's kind of like the Phantom of the Opera movie, which is also this year that Joel Schumacher did, where that's a terrible fucking movie. But, God, it looks <laughs> so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there has to be, like, a name for this, like, this plot point in, like, there's always, like, these movies where they're hunting, like, a monster, some kind of, like, enemy that we we don't know how to beat them. And then they go through, like, the motion of, like, oh, long ago, there was, a like, they, they, they do that whole thing. And it's, it is the most kind of generic version of that, of, like, we have to figure out how to defeat Dracula. It, it's very, very by the numbers and is just kind of, like boring <laughs> yep really is and like <laughs> there's just other things too where like they they try and like move the plot along like, i think the biggest indicative thing of this movie's weird plotting is there's a certain point where during like that big sequence we mentioned where the werewolf version of kate beckinsale's brother was attacking and then helsing gets bit so he's going to become a werewolf yeah. and there's a point later on where like they're trying to you know confront dracula and it's him Carl and uh, Frankenstein um, after um, the Kate Bacon's husband kidnapped. That's why they're going up to the castle now. Or they're trying to get to it. Um, and fucking Frankenstein is like, wait, you're a werewolf. I can't trust you. We have to kill him. And then fucking Van Helsing knocks him out and puts him in a crypt. And it's like, why? <laughs> it's only just because like Frankenstein can't be there when they end up getting to the castle at this point. Yeah. So they just, like, knock him out and put him in a tomb. Like they the hide him. <laughs> fun, right. Wouldn't the more fun thing be just Van Helsing trying to convince, like, look, we're kind of down here on a lot of people. If I'm a werewolf man, I could, like, attack, and I have, like, some kind of supernatural power. So we have, like, an edge a bit. Like, you can kill me after we confront Dracula and save her. Yeah. As opposed yeah. to knock out. And put him in a tomb? Why? <laughs> Speaking of, like, the, the brother character, it's, like, they have this whole thing where, like, the conflict with Hugh Jackman and Kate Beckinsale is that, like, he's, like, 
that's not your brother anymore. It's, you know, it's, he's a werewolf. We got to kill him. And she's like, no, it's still my brother. And, and it's, it's just, it doesn't like, it doesn't go well. It, like, I, I always hate that kind of thing in, in movies, you know? Um, and they don't even play with the conflict of it later when Van Helsing could be like, oh my God, kill me or something like have a weird change of heart because he's been transformed into a werewolf. But yeah. no, he's still kind of the same guy, but also like, I want to live. So like, oh, okay, so you're just like an asshole? <laughs> like, <laughs> there's nothing <laughs> compelling about this character. Yeah. We, we were talking a bit about, like, the, the sort of the jokes. And, like, one of the, the, the lines that Dracula's Brides has that I think is so funny is when I think I think it's the section where, in the village, when, um, when it's, like, one of his brides and Kate Beckinsale, and <laughs> the brides just goes... Too bad. So sad. <laughs> it's so yes. bad. It's so bad. Uh, it, that is the, like, it's the problem I think with a lot of like the humor in this movie is that it's it's kind of that thing of like this is a period piece. It's set in like eighteen eighty eight or whatever. Right. But all the jokes are like jokes that you would hear in two thousand and four. Yes. And so yeah, and so like it just is like. Why are they making these jokes? Like, there's just it's right. So like weird. one bit in particular, the bit that like is like the most they give David Wenham to do really in this movie is there's a point where like during a big Bride of Dracula's attack, he saves a woman, a villager, and she's like, "Oh, how can I repay you?" And he whispers in her ear, and she's like, "Oh, I guess I could do all that." And then it cuts to like them waking up the next morning having slept together because it's like, "Hey, <laughs> case of the not gays," because yep. David Wenham totally fucks ladies. <laughs> 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 yeah. and that's the idea of the the, the fun humor and, the, and once again the most that guy gets to do would just manipulate a villager woman after saving her life and having sex with her yeah. great cool dude too speaking more on like the sort of towards the end of the movie when like the revelation is is revealed that like van helsing is is the Van Helsing that we all knew? Like, it, it isn't really much of a twist, like like you mentioned. Like, we always no. kind of we knew that already, but like, there's this like this talk about him being like the left hand of God, and I'm like, right. that sounds fucking cool, but in the movie, it's not really like at all. <laughs> Further evidence to my Gabriel question. Yes, earlier. yeah, yeah. Yes, that, that that kind of fits. But I guess I mean it's a bit different from like regular Van Helsing in that Van Helsing at least initially, I don't know, maybe there's some I haven't seen all the Universal Monster movies or even the Hammer movies um where they kind of did versions of this character, but I don't recall Van Helsing being like immortal, which I think is kind of like usually the charm of Van Helsing is that he's like, "Oh, he's just a very intelligent mortal man." Who is trying to yeah. face off against these guys? But if you want to change that up, I'm cool with that. But the problem is that they just don't do anything with it. Yeah, because like my what I th this is so funny. The the thing I thought of when I like was watching this was um, because I haven't seen any of the other like Universal monster movies. My reference for Van Helsing was the Hotel Transylvania. I think it's in three. They have a, like a Van Helsing. So yeah, I always thought it was just like a lineage passed down, like to from generation to generation, but yeah, they do the, the immortal thing, which is, yeah. <laughs> which, yeah, it's curiosity. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then like, once we get to this ending, it's just one fucking like bad sequence after another, where there's like the whole bit where Frankenstein is like zip lining basically and jumping from different things. And it's like a really bad CG <laughs> version of Frankenstein. And then like the whole fight that happens where Dracula goes full vamp versus, uh, Van Helsing werewolf, and it looks so bad. It looks just like the earliest test that you would do in an animatic form. It's like, okay, now we're going to do the real version of it. We're going to render it now, right? We're going to do that. <laughs> um, and it, it all is just indicative, especially of like, when I was watching that little behind the scenes feature, the special effects guys are talking, as many did in 2004, of like, now that we're in the digital age, there's no limitation to what we can do. Yeah. And it's like, guys, there's limitations. <laughs> It is that sort of, like, 90s, kind of 2000s CGI thing of, like, we can do anything now, right? <laughs> like, the, right. The, the sky's the limit. But they use CGI for everything. And, like, a lot of stuff where I'm like, you guys were not ready for to do... Like, the technology was not there at this point to no. do what you're doing right now. But, like, there's something a bit... It's a bit of, like, in a way, I kind of like it in a novelty kind of way. 
you know, mm. it, in like, because especially you look at a lot of the CGI from this time and with how so, like a lot of it has aged, it can look quite goofy and kind of cartoonish. But it, again, in that, in a novelty kind of way, I kind of like that. Um, I'm not saying that for everything in this movie because there's some stuff that just looks no, like no. I mean, I think bad, that's the but... thing. That's the thing I feel with like say the original Spider-Man, which I think is a really yeah. fun movie, but the CG there um, isn't great. It, I think it has shown its age quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I think at its best, it can kind of look like, and I'm not directly because I prefer this thing I'm comparing it to, but it kind of feels like when you go back to the old like Ray Harry house and the stop motion stuff. Yes, where mm-hmm. it's like this is somebody who had a limited means to be able to do this and was at least trying their hearts out. I feel that is the case with, like, this movie and a lot of the other big CG movies where it's kind of, like, charmingly brazen in a way. Where it's like, yeah, we're doing this. We're breaking the doors down. Even though, like, oh, you broke them down and they, like, hit you in the face. Just like when they came back. (laughs) Yeah. Hit you square in the jaw. Um, But that's, that's at least more comforting to me than now where I know a lot of people work hard on CG effects. But also it feels like there's a lot more stress and a lot more of, like, that thing we've been hearing about, like, oh, we're overworking special effects artists. It feels like that. We're, this feels, like, rushed out, and there are, like, pencil marks still there <laughs> that I can see, basically. Yeah. I, and, like, I, I will say, like, the, the Harryhausen stuff I, I do kind of think is, like, I think that has more, like, love and, like, craft put into it. I see what you mean, right. though. But, like, the, the it was this time where it was, like, we can do anything in CGI. Let's put a fucking face on a wave and let's create these monstrosities where like a lot of like the sort of horrifying like you know it's scary because like the cgi is just like bad and that like kind of <laughs> yeah. it, but it almost helps in a way because it makes it kind of like creepier i think the biggest problem really is just that they don't know how to light any of the cg effects no. that's a big thing where like they can't match the lighting that's on the actual practical set the best CG should, like, try and disguise that with, like, shadows and stuff. Perfect for, like, a yeah. horror movie-themed thing mm-hmm. like this. And they can't do that because fucking, uh, despite the fact that he's in this big, dark castle, Van Helsing werewolf looks like he's in a convenience store with the, like, overhead light <laughs> directly on him. Yeah. And you can see every bad hair on his body. Yeah. I mean, like, that en- the ending section when they're both, like in their monster form. I got like the thing of like, when you watch a recent movie, like movies are are released now and you're like, Oh, we're just watching two like pieces of like mushy animation fight. Right. That is more often previs, but this feels just like, Nope, we are doing this (laughs) as like, we're, we're we're doing this afterward. We're going to match the shots that are in here. They even talk about in that behind the scenes thing. where It's like, we try to match every single camera move of the, you know, in Prague, that was all the stuff on the shot there and the sets and everything. And it all just looks like it's barely in the frame <laughs> at all. I don't know. A part of me wishes, like, I mean, it would have been so fucking hard to do, but make the whole thing in black and white and make it look like the intro. I think that would have been, like, so cool. I mean, like, Universal, I don't think, would ever have gone for it. Like, a major studio would not do that. But, like, I don't know. Like, that, that especially because that black and white stuff looks so good. And I think, like, that that, that section, like has cgi but is is kind of masked a bit by the black and white right yes and 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 kind of this like i i don't know this might just be me talking out of my ass but i feel like when movies were still shot on like film and they had cgi elements i feel like the the film sort of there is kind of a it it masks it a little bit and kind of it feels more organic Mm -hmm. yeah but but yeah this (laughs) The, the children, we should probably talk about the, the children at oh, some point. Oh, yes, the, chi- <laughs> the, the, the various uh, gelatinous sacks of vampire children that are birthed. And I guess this is just what, you know, if Dracula and his brides copulate, they get horrible nightmare, like, gremlin things. Yeah, yeah they're like, yeah, they look like, kind of like piranhas, kind of. Like, on, like, their mouth, they have, like, all the teeth and everything, but... <laughs> There's just this weird plot device, especially where, like, there's supposed to be this big thing we're supposed to be counting down to, where it's like, oh no, Dracula's gonna have his children rise, and they will be taught how to, you know, be his army to try and destroy the world and stuff like that. And when they're these, like, small little dudes, it just doesn't feel, like, that (laughs) entertaining. If you're gonna do that, give them, like, personality, there's, like, a big horde. There's just, like, a giant mass. That feels maybe, like, the most wave thing. (laughs) 
honestly, uh, in this movie, is that kind of stuff. And it just feels like, if you're going to do that, make them like gremlins. Have them do fucking, like, crazy shit. Have yeah. like attack individual people and stuff like that. That makes it as opposed to like most of what they do is just like lift people off the ground and like that's it, really. And like a, <laughs> some of them like swarm and then they like kill one guy, I guess. But like that's give them weird. Pers- I want Stripe, the vampire kid or whatever. <laughs> yeah, it, and it is part of the thing of like, like there's a lot of plot here, and yeah. it's it, it feels very it, it's stretched way too thin for what it's trying to do. And I kind of appreciate how ambitious it's trying to be in, like, just, I mean, yeah, the plot, but also, like, the, yeah, like you said, the visual effects of it all, but. And and also, the, the fun thing about this movie is that Universal was putting their chips in for this one, because they had planned to make, obviously, a sequel, but also they were developing a theme park ride and a spinoff TV show called Transylvania, which would have apparently featured, this is all rumor, basically. We know this thing existed, but the rumored plot was a Wild West sheriff has taken to Europe and has, like, become the sheriff of Transylvania and, like, would have to fight monsters or whatever and Ben Helsing, Hugh Jackman, would pop up in guest appearances. Uh, which, for the record, that sounds like a fun show. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I would love to right. have seen that. <laughs> and, obviously, that did not happen because this movie grossed $300 million on a $170 million budget. And all that stuff was whisked away in one of many attempts to kind of do a, you know, reboot of the Universal Monsters. And, you know, we joke about, like, the Universal shit or whatever, all the t- like, Dark Universe. But do you feel like they can still viably do that? Do you feel like there's a way where they can do, like, this sort of shared universe thing at this point? <sighs> yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, like, again, disclaimer that I have not seen the original Universal Monster movies, but... um Right. Yeah, I, I feel like this movie kind of made me realize, because when I had seen, like, the Cruise Mummy, which is, you know, the Dark Universe uh, origin story, I guess, I was just like, "There's this is not going to work. Like, I just don't think there's a way to do, like, this. But this is kind of, like, a, a sort of ideal way to do it of, like, yeah, have, like, a monster hunter type of character who can, like, hunt these monsters down or something. I don't know if they could they would do that now. I feel like now they would try and like set up like five sequels again or whatever. Right, which I don't necessarily want in theory, but I think this movie would be greatly improved by having him face off against one of these guys. Sure. Yes, as that's, opposed to all of them. Yeah, that is kind of the problem with the movie. It's like, it's 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 doing the Dracula, Frankenstein, Wolfman and like Jekyll and Hyde and it's like this is the this is the first movie. I de- you know if, if, this, if this was like a fran- a future franchise like this was just your first movie like maybe calm down first like I get that the mummy was like massively successful but like maybe tone it down a bit <laughs> right especially when like I think the perfect way to do it honestly because they've been trying to also like post this they've been trying to do various different versions of Van Helsing even like in 2012 this was originally going to be written by Alex Kurtzman and Robert Orsi as a Tom Cruise vehicle, this, like, Van Helsing movie in 2012. And then, obviously, Alex Kurtzman and uh, Tom Cruise did something different, which we may talk about a bit later. (laughs) Um, And then there was recently, um, it was announced that Julius Avery, who did, like, Overlord and uh, The Pope's Exorcist, was going to direct a reboot uh, that was going to be produced by James Wan, which I think that could work for me especially in this modern vein where you have like the invisible man that was done with elizabeth moss that was not really tied into anything my pitch honestly would be for if you want to do a good ben helsing like this have him hunt down the universal monster who has not been in any recent movies for some reason it baffles me the creature from the black lagoon do it like prey or predator where it's him hunting down the creature from the black lagoon yeah. That would be such a good movie, and especially if you want to set it now, there's a lot you can do with, like, an ocean monster <laughs> wanting to seek vengeance <laughs> on humans and shit yeah. like that. There, that character is so untapped. They've been trying for decades, but it's like, that is the way to go, I think. Yeah, and, like, Guillermo del Toro kind of kind of did it, but, um, you know, right. but he was like, but what if he but, fucks? <laughs> right, but he's not the creature from the Black Lagoon. He right. is... I don't know what they called him in the movie. I can't remember. Just the creature or whatever? Yeah, I think they just called him, like, yeah. The Lee Winnell Invisible Man felt like such an obvious way if they wanted to, like, do these movies. Like, not a, not the dark universe, obviously, because that will never see the light of day, unfortunately. But give, give him the Blumhouse. Let, like, weird 
like indie directors do these kind of small movies that will probably make like so much money because like horror sells. Yeah, unless you have say a Renfield, which was their most recent example. <laughs> yeah. Which like, we don't need to talk about Renfield. Um, <laughs> um, though I'll say also an interesting thing. Best part of that movie is the opening black and white bits where they put Nicolas Cage, and Nicolas Holt into the old Dracula movie. It's like the yeah. best part of that movie, honestly. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah. That's my pitch. Okay, is give it to Blumhouse, let Blumhouse like pick whoever, and then like maybe make a black and white movie because like that would be really fucking cool to see like a, a especially if it was shot well. I think it would be really great to see a, a black and white like Universal new Universal monster movie. We say many things about Marvel all the time, but I thought that Werewolf by Night special at least looked pretty good. I thought yeah. it was like kind of fun for what it was. Yeah. I mean, hey, Michael Giacchino, maybe he could do it. I don't know. He's doing. He's too busy doing them, the giant ants. That he's remaking that movie. The, oh, the really? Movie. Oh, that's, that's cool. That's at least actually. what he's announced to be doing. I would hope. Yeah, that'd be a fun movie to see. But yeah. um, uh, we've clearly diverted away from Van Helsing. Is there any like final thing? I guess the only other plot thing we haven't talked about is just fucking Kate Beckinsale getting killed by uh, Wolverine. I'm sorry, the werewolf Van Helsing. <laughs> Um, and, uh, then he burns her on a pyre like Darth Vader, and then her s- face appears in the sky. <laughs> face appears in the sky like, like, um, like Mufasa, which is all I can Mufasa. think of. <laughs> I, I was trying to imagine Kate Beckinsale, like, saying the line from The Lion King. <laughs> to, you know who you are. <laughs> you know who you are, Van Helsing. Yeah, yeah. that's the point. I was just like, why is she in the sky? <laughs> like, what the fuck is this? But but yeah, weren't you so so <laughs> filled with tragedy at the death of Kate Beckinsale? Didn't you cry? Weren't you just like so upset that that happened? Gonna be honest, I... I, I watched this movie like two or three days ago and I'm already struggling to remember like what her death scene was. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, it, it really is just like a, a really forgettable movie. And like, it isn't terrible like it's not the worst thing i've ever seen but like just like forgettable just yeah um, yeah i mean i guess those are your final thoughts you don't have anything else to add um <laughs> yeah let me check my notes here um oh i like the part where he um i think it's ben housing i can't remember but he dips like the arrow in like holy water to like shoot yes <laughs> that's pretty cool another thing i was thinking of that like all I could think of, like, during this was, like, this could, could have been a cool video game. I, I don't think they ever made, like, a, a video game for this at all. Oh, there was a licensed video game. There was? Oh, man. I've seen the great era of bad licensed video games. I believe it was a PlayStation 2 <laughs> and That's... Xbox 360. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I'm, wow. Apparently it plays, like, Devil May Cry. Which, again, sounds kind of cool, but, like, yeah. The, the graphics, I'm sure, look beautiful, just like the original film. Uh, <laughs> I bet I bet the game, like, kind of looks better than the movie in some cases. Because, like, I don't know. I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised necessarily. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, I mean, for me, I will agree. I think it's... I would say it's forgettable, but at the same time, like, this movie did stick with me, even if it was, like, a bad movie. Like, obviously, like, the details of the plot don't, but, like, the stuff that sticks in is, like, the fun stuff, like, Richard Roxburgh as Dracula. Um, even the bad CGI, there's a bit of that kitschy charm to it at this point. We're 20 years removed, so it's kitschier at this yeah. point. Just like, oh, look, this outdated, antiquated CG. Um, but it, it really does feel like the problem with giving somebody like Steven Summers, who worked really well with, like, s- movies that were between, like, 30 to 40 80 million dollars like all his best movies tend to be like that kind of mid-range budget fun kind of like blockbuster stuff that we don't get anymore because a blockbuster has to be hundreds of millions of dollars yeah 300 million or nothing right exactly it has to make a billion dollars to gross as opposed to like oh i don't know let's do like a, a van helsing movie that's or let's do like the mummy movie it's like about i think it's like 100 to 80 million like somewhere around that range and, you know, it's like it's not going to be our top tier performance necessarily, but we're going to like put it out there. And then the problem is like when that makes a lot of money, that gives Universal the wrong idea and also gives Summers the wrong idea about like what people were interested in. So where I think that's a big problem with The Mummy Returns, I think it is also a very big problem with uh, this Van Helsing movie he's done. Um, but at the same time, 
well, I would love to see, like, you know, bring Steven Summers back, but give him yeah something a bit smaller, like a bit bigger than like T- Odd Thomas was like a $10 million movie or something. It was like a lot more scaled down, but he's yeah. still trying to put as much CG goop in there as possible. And it's like, now I feel like, you know, it's been 10 years. Let Steven come back. Let him do like a fun B movie of sorts with a decent budget. And I think he could do a pretty good job. Even like, you know, him handling one of those Blumhouse movies, I think would be fun. Sure, I can yeah. see that happening. Yeah. 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 It, it feels like he's one of those directors that just kind of got lost because like kind of the, the movies that he like made kind of don't get made anymore. Like you said, like it feels like he's just one of those directors that got like lost in the whole, you know, in this whole new Hollywood system. Um, but yeah, I would love to see him come back. Cause like, I, I do think he's a good director and like, yeah, I don't know. Let him do something universal. Let him do something else. I don't know. See what he wants. The, the mummy has been having this like great resurgence, like in, in terms of like h- how people conceive that movie now. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's the right time for him to, him to come back. I, I say this, like having seen Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, but also being like, I love that Brendan Fraser's had this comeback, but part of the big thing why he kind of receded was how much he got physically fucked up on the third Mummy movie. Right. And stuff. Yeah. I just don't feel like, I don't want to see Rick O'Connell just be like in a chair. <laughs> just like, you go, youngin. Whatever, yeah, you I keep mean... going. Because even like the third movie is attempting to be like a legacy sequel where they like only seven years after the first, because like the kid is now grown up. And he's oh. like, oh, I'm kind of like, kind of trying to replace Brendan Fraser, basically. They already did that in that third movie, and it's rough. I'm good without them doing more mummy necessarily. Yeah, don't don't do the mummy, but I don't know. Give give Summers like something, you know. See if he, you know, see what he wants to make. I'm sure he, I'm sure he, he wants something. He, he wants to make something, but <laughs> it's kind of funny, honestly, with the mummy. Like most of my nostalgia is directly for speaking once again of theme park attractions, the mummy. At Universal, the, okay. which is themed after still the Stephen Summers movies, because the premise of that one is that this came out like in two thousand, I think, uh, four or five. This coaster before like the third movie, and it's they're shooting the third Mummy movie at an actual like, <laughs> uh, like Egyptian tomb, and it turns out there's an actual curse. So Brendan Fraser's like in the while you're in line waiting to go on the roller coaster, he's just like, oh hey yeah, we're shooting Mummy three. It's pretty great and spooky. Things are happening behind him. And he's having fun. Um, and the coaster itself is great, too. That's one of my favorite rides in Universal, honestly. Because there's a... Especially, there's a great bit where, like, you seem to be going through, like, a big, giant, like... Because it's an indoor roller coaster. And, like, oh, you go down, like, one loop. And then it seems like you're at the end of the ride suddenly. Where it's like, oh, yeah, everybody come off the... Uh, get out of your ride vehicles. Thank you for coming, Universal. And then, like, scarabs attack the guys in the booth. Oh, <laughs> and then they get eaten. Cool. And then you go on the full roller coaster <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> wow. I have not been to Universal, like, oh, man, since I was, like, 12, maybe. I don't, even, I don't, I don't think I rode The Mummy. That's, that sounds really cool, though. <laughs> it's a really fun ride, yes, for sure. But now we're, we're done with talking about Van Helsing and related summersisms. So now it's time for our weekly segment of Between the Lines. So Between the Lines is a segment that Brian and I do every week in which, uh, you know, we talk about Another movie that, you know, is tangentially related to, uh, in this case, you know, our E for Egregious episode. We kind of, we had some behind the scenes uh, back and forth earlier before we uh, turned the mics on about uh, when we decided for the Egregious episodes, we're going to be talking about bad movies. So not ones we recommend necessarily, but bad ones that kind of reminded us of the movie in question. So, uh, Brian, you go first. What's your pick? Yeah. So as I was digging through the, you know, watching watching the mummy returns and i uh I, I remembered that the scorpion king was a a movie i hadn't seen before i had seen the like cgi dwayne johnson i always thought that it was from the movie the scorpion king i didn't know it was from the mummy returns um and that man that is some real rough cgi by the way and it's a very bad setup for the rock as well in that movie where he's in the prologue and he doesn't pop up until like the very end of the movie in that cg form because it doesn't really look like him only like no. kind of it's very very it's it's like one of the most like uncanny things i've seen that isn't like you know the, it reminded me of like the recent luke skywalker in the mandalorian thing 
Oh, where he looked so great and lifelike and like he was totally real and not at all like a, a yeah. dead puppet man yeah, of some the, sort. The... But I'll, I will say that moment, not to keep interrupting you in the middle of your seg- your bit, but uh, it does at least lead to like my favorite thing of like when Dwayne Johnson's revealed in CG and then Arnold Vosloo comes up just like, <sighs> like this <laughs> yeah. is so funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that movie's that movie's wild, but right. um, but the Scorpion King, but the Scorpion King, a, a the prequel to the Mummy Returns, which is about Matthias and does his, his it's his origin story basically, and a thing I, I didn't I didn't know is that it's directed by Chuck Russell, who right, uh, admittedly I have not seen any of his movies, but I, he directed The Mask, which yep. I. I'll reveal this on mic. I'm about to. I'm about to embarrass myself. I've never seen the mask, but I have. I've definitely seen like a lot. Not the whole thing, but I've seen a lot of Son of the Mask. Not by my choice. Like it was. It was like on. One of my cousins was watching it at some point, and I was like watching it, and I was kind of creeped out by the mask, and so I stopped. But yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyways, um, the Scorpion King. I think this movie is way worse than Van Helsing. Because, like, Mm -hmm. as we talked about, Van Helsing has, like, ambitious in, like, it's trying to do a lot with CGI. It is trying to, like, really go for it. It's a blockbuster. It's a big movie. And this movie's not really a blockbuster it's 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 like what 60 million if i remember correctly was the budget right and it came out like in april it was kind of just like a genre e programmer yeah um although i did see on the wikipedia by the way that it had the biggest april opening since the matrix <laughs> like that's so weird to think about but um yeah this movie i think is way worse than uh than van helsing it, it is so boring and it is 90 minutes, which it does not feel 90 minutes. It feels like it's, like, four hours long. Um, yeah. And trying to do a lot of similar stuff that th- they do in, in The Mummy and Van Helsing, or, well, in Just The Mummy, but um, a lot of CGI, where, like, they, they, they do the whole army of, like, scorpions at the end, and it looks... <laughs> I mean, if you want to see some really, like, dated CGI, this is, like you know really bad um and look say what like i have a lot of negative thoughts on dwayne johnson as an actor now but like it is really impressive that this did not kill his career (laughs) in 2002 (laughs) because like he's whatever he's doing his like shtick that he has done always and like continues to do but he looks so stupid (laughs) He looks so goofy to me every time I like they cut to him. It, it's such a and it's it, it is so indicative of like a lot of the bad things we've said about Van Helsing. You mentioned the joke with uh our boy Carl and like the woman he saves. Do you remember mm-hmm. the 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 joke in the in the Scorpion King with the little kid? Do you know so there's a bit where like You guys refresh my memory. I'm a bit <laughs> Fuzzy, even script. though I saw this fairly recently, like in the last two years, but I can't remember it at all. So, like, it's the the the, the female character who, let me get it, yeah, is uh, played by Kelly Who, and yes, is um she like fall falls into like a, a pond or something, or it's like a wishing well, and this little kid like you see this little kid like flip a coin, or whatever. And then the she comes out, and of course it's the early two thousands, so she's like scantily clad, and the kid is like, "God praised me," and I'm like, "Jesus Christ, this is mm-hmm. so like awful." Like the jokes are so bad, the jokes are even worse because like Van Helsing is like medi, you know, it's it's the eighteen hundreds, whatever. This is set in like Gomorra, <laughs> so like biblical times, <laughs> and yet it's and yet the jokes again are like very two thousands. I will say, I guess, Michael Clark Duncan is great in it. I love seeing mm-hmm. him in this. Um, I wish there was more of him, because when he, like, pops up at the end and he's, like, fighting all these, like, guys, he's got, like, a, a group of, like, ten guys that are, like, you know, rushing him, and he's great. But, yeah, what a what a real stinker. <laughs> um, yeah, King. I mean... I've seen the Scorpion King. Um, I have not seen the four sequels that are direct to video that have come insane. out. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm I actually looking this up. Uh, one of them is a prequel. Of course, a and prequel. The other to a prequel. three, 
right of our, our sequels. Um, but but yeah, I've I've seen the the Scorpion King, and I would agree that I think it's bad. But I think the one thing you're kind of forgetting that I personally think makes it a hair above like a Van Helsing for me is there's some fun stunt work. Like I would say, especially like the opening bit, I think there's a lot of fun stunt work to the degree that like when I was watching this movie and I hadn't watched it until like a couple years ago for the first time, I just realized like this would be so good speaking back to the theme park thing as like a 20 minute stunt show. Yeah. At Universal. Yeah. Where it's just like, oh, the Scorpion King's making people fall or whatever. It, it has that aesthetic to it, but that can't sustain a full movie. <laughs> no. Like at all. No. Um, and I agree with you that Chuck Russell's a fun director, especially um, or not, along with the ones you mentioned, like The Mask. He also did um, the 1980s The Blob, which is one of the great horror remakes, I would say. Uh, okay. really, like some of the best, like especially practical, like people get melted in that movie. <laughs> and cool. it's really cool. And also Nightmare on Elm Street 3, which many would say is like one of the better sequels in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. Okay. Um, so he's a, he was also a pretty solid genre director. He even also directed Eraser, a fun Arnold movie from the 90s. Um, so he had like some fun stuff. I think the Scorpion King kind of killed that for him, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. He's another guy where like right after like he deals with the Mummy franchise, he really falls off. Really, like don't touch the Mummy franchise, anybody. Like that's the big <laughs> thing. Just like yeah. we shouldn't do any. Like Universal should not do another Mummy movie because Steven Summers out, uh, the fucking uh, Chuck Russell out, uh, Rob Cohen justly out for a lot of reasons. <laughs> Um, and Alex Kurtzman keeps working, but he's never directed a movie since the, the yeah. 17 Mummy. <laughs> that's so, yeah, that's so interesting that this is like the, it's the career killer <laughs> for everything. It's cursed. The Mummy's <laughs> curse is that your directorial <laughs> career will fucking fizzle immediately yeah. afterwards. Um, because I hadn't seen The Scorpion King, it also gave further context to um, Jordan Peele's Nope when they're talking about like horses yes. and he goes, he goes like yes. they, they use camels instead. And then in this movie, they make like an effort when he's like, camels are smarter. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> but yeah, that was, a, that was a funny little, and it's such a weird connection. Like it's, I think about that movie a lot, but like the connection of, to the Scorpion King and he has like the hoodie with the little like logo the, on the crew it. Jacket. The it's, it's the perfect, like just forgettable movie where like you don't remember until OJ says it's like, oh yeah, that was a movie that did exist, right? It's yeah. so genius. Yeah, one of the many reasons that movie is a fucking masterpiece. Yeah, but that's all I had to say on the Scorpion King. What what's yours? <laughs> well, mine um is, you know, very much real. We've been kind of dancing around this movie the whole episode. But I have the 2017 The Mummy, directed by Alex Kurtzman and uh, starring Tom Cruise. Uh, which, for my money, like, once again, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor is the worst movie movie Universal has done in the 21st century. But this is not far off. And it is trying to, like, you know, very famously create the dark universe. They hyped it with the big photo of Johnny Depp as the Invisible Man. Oh, yeah, and, hold on. Wait a minute. Uh, oh, I'm, I guess, I wonder if someone's Zoom background's about to change. <laughs> I downloaded the picture <laughs> earlier. <laughs> Um, um, but, but yeah, they were trying to tease this whole thing about the dark universe, uh, that was supposed to come from this. And, um, the problem with this movie is that, uh, it is such, yeah, now I'm seeing it. There's Johnny Depp, there's Javier Bardem, our Frankenstein, and Sofia Patella as her, I forgot as, what her thing was. She's just the mummy, mummy, right? <laughs> right, I don't know. And Russell Crowe, who I will say, Russell Crowe is the spotlight to me of he is. that 2017 mummy yeah because he just turns gray and becomes <laughs> mr hyde and it's so <laughs> funny um but yeah it's it's such a movie where like tom cruise is kind of trying to inject obviously some of his mission impossible stuff into this movie but also he's trying to kind of inject a bit of like that edge of tomorrow thing with his character nick morton everyone's favorite adventurer <laughs> um who is such a fucking dick <laughs> The whole really movie. Is. He's yeah. one of the worst modern protagonists in, like, a blockbuster movie. Where he just, like, sleeps around, but, like, in a way that feels just sleazy. And just, like, abandons people left and right. Um, keeps seeing his dead friend, who's fucking awful, played by, what's his Jake Johnson, who's Jake fun, Johnson, usually. who I love. Bad, yeah. bad use of him in this fucking movie. Yeah. Um, in a ripoff, by the way, of the best friend from uh, the American Wolf in London huge fucking ripoff oh of sure yeah there. yeah um and uh yeah all of the action scenes are bad like the opening bit where he's like i don't know in it's egypt and sambal wherever the fuck he is and um he's like they're going through that house as like the military raids happening is one of the worst shot like 
combat scenes I've ever seen <laughs> in a movie that cost over, like, $5 million. It's so atrocious, and the universe building's dumb, and uh, the only good thing about this movie was that trailer that accidentally leaked, the IMAX trailer. Oh, they right, got rid of No, the, no audio, or, right? No, they got rid of the music... <laughs> and, like, the bigger things. But they had, like, some of the other sound effects in. Yeah. Like, fucking What's-Her-Face, uh, Annabelle Wallace, like, being thrown out of the airplane, like, <laughs> and that's it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I Again, I think, I can't remember if I mentioned this uh, before or during uh, we were recording, but I was thinking about watching it, but I, I, again, for this, but I just could not. And it's not on streaming services, so I would have to, like, you know, rent it, which... No, I don't want to watch this movie again. Is it is it the worst movie Tom Cruise has made? Like, is it the is it his worst movie? Would you say? It's one of them. I would personally say I don't know. I haven't seen this movie in a decade. But my least favorite for a while was Rock of Ages. I haven't seen that one. This one the is musical rare. one. Uh, I think it's really fucking bad, and I don't like it. But at the same time, at least in that movie, the one spotlight is Cruz, who's playing sort of like a hair metal musician guy. And he's trying, he's putting his all into it, and he's kind like he's the one kind of funny thing about it. Versus I think this is, if nothing else, it's the worst Tom Cruise performance, I would say. Sure. Okay. Because I think it is just like a massive miscalculation about what appeals about him as a star. <laughs> yeah. I, I I saw a tweet about like the, the about the mummy that was like it, it, yeah, it's so bad. It's such a horrible movie, but I'm kind of glad that it was bad and I'm glad that like everyone hated it because now we just get Cruz doing like Mission Impossible and he's a top gun and you know, he just gets to do whatever he wants now. I guess a necessary evil, I would agree, right? That it, it, this had to happen. Yeah. I would have hated for him to get stuck in the fucking dark universe for like a decade and <laughs> make like four more mummy movies. Right, there was a world where, like, I think he had probably shot, like, Fallout, right, at that point. Because that was, like, 2018. So it feels like he had already had that, like, basically on the block. There's a world where Fallout was his last Mission Impossible movie. God. And that series would have gotten worse and his career would have gotten worse. Yeah. If the fucking Dark Universe thing happened and he showed up, I don't know, in a post credit scene for Bill Condon's cancelled Bride of Frankenstein movie. Oh, man. Just fucking cursed sentence there. Well, I mean, even though, like, the best thing that that guy's ever done is Gods and Monsters. And if anything, if he was going to ever put his all into something, it would have been a Bride of Frankenstein movie based on that. It feels like what he's been kind of dreaming of doing. And then it all just fell apart. I'm sure it still would not have been good. But at the same time, if anyone was going to make that movie, Bill Condon is the person, I would argue. Yeah, but, you know, we got the mummy. And... No. that's And, we got, and, and the really great thing is we got infinite dark universe memes out of it which is kind of the best right they're still going movie. somewhat <laughs> yeah. to this to this day yeah. it still was like it's a meme that's outlasted the franchise and i think that's if nothing else that whole dark universe thing will be i think sort of like the marker when like we look back at the time after the shared universe finally dies and it's like it's the key example of like this is the worst example of trying to do it on every level <laughs> just so bad yeah yeah the mummy <laughs> <laughs> yep, so once again, to repeat our titles, I had the 2017 Alex Kurtzman directed The Mummy to not recommend to any of you. Yes, and I had the uh, 2002 Chuck Russell directed The Scorpion King, uh, which you should avoid at all costs, please. <laughs> yes, do so. Uh, but we're going to be wrapping up the episode here, though stay tuned. We're going to be talking about uh, some stuff that we have down the pipeline, but we wanted to thank some people. Like uh, Burial Grid for our intro music. Uh, purchase this music at burialgrid.com. Uh, thanks to Michelle Kyle for our artwork. Uh, you can find her at MishKyle96 on Twitter. Uh, that's M I C H K Y L E 96. And uh, thank you to our Patreon supporters on patreon.com slash cinema number two letter. Uh, where over there you get access to, you know, be able to vote for in polls for certain movies that we'll cover, and also uh, audio bonuses, including as of uh, now, this is coming out August 1st, so we would have already put out um, our Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 audio review and our Barbie Oppenheimer double feature, which we haven't recorded either of those. We haven't seen any of those yet. And uh, also our top 10 directorial debuts, which will be our big bonus podcast of July, which would have come out at this time 
but we're literally about to record it, like, after yeah. we're done with this. <laughs> hey, everyone, this is Thomas with a little pickup here, uh, just to add to the Patreon discussion that um, we put a few more audio reviews on the schedule uh, to talk about in August, um, since we record this Van Helsing episode. Um, through August, we're going to also be doing reviews of Talk to Me, which was the recently released A24 horror film, uh, which we'll be uh, putting up an audio review of later this week. This episode's coming out. Uh, then we'll also be doing the following week, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. And then uh, we'll be doing one last one in August for The Last Voyage of the Demeter, which is appropriate given that is kind of a sideways Dracula adaptation, you know, kind of fits into this episode as well. Um, so those will be the three audio reviews we'll do in August, in addition to the big bonus episode, which we'll announce in a couple episodes here uh, for August, what uh, will be at the end of the month. We'll have one big uh, August bonus podcast uh, that you'll all uh, find out about as the episodes roll along. And uh, you can also uh, find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook over at Cinema Number Two Letter, um, and then any other uh, you know social media sites I might join to try and get away from the one that's crumbling. <laughs> and you know, at these various different social media places, uh, would you recommend that you uh, you know give us a shout? Uh, this is the first episode we've recorded since the first episode of the show came out. And uh, so, if you have any feedback, please share with us, and we'll definitely share it on the show. Including, I have something from. Uh, Mike, who is at Jarek on Twitter, he's been a, a loyal listener of the Double Edge Double Bill show, uh, so he was just in reference to the Jaws episode, saying, quote, uh, excellent movie and discussion to get things rolling. And thank you, Mike. We appreciate yeah, that. Thank you. And uh, you can also uh, find me on Twitter and Letterboxd as at not the Who's Tommy. And I also do some writing at marianitomas.wordpress.com and at film-cred.com. And also, you know, it's August now, so I can start promoting this. I'll be at Dragon Con. Doing panels like I've usually been doing uh, that Labor Day weekend over in Atlanta, Georgia. We're still working out the schedule, but I know I've um, I'm in the mix for a couple panels. I've been announced like uh, 2023 in horror for the horror track. Also one about M Night Shyamalan and some other things. I'll have more details in the coming episodes. I'm sure I'll splice something in with my schedule at some point. But yeah, I'll be there. Come say hi. Uh, yeah, and uh, you can follow me on Letterbox and Twitter. Uh, at my name, Brian Andrade, B-R-Y-A-N-A-N-D-R-A-D-E. Uh, my letterbox handle is the two name, my name combined with a three at the end. Uh, yeah, follow me on there and see what, you know, videos of Tom Cruise at promoting Mission Impossible. I'll be retweeting. <laughs> <laughs> All of them, I'm yeah. sure. Um, and uh, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and other podcasting platforms. If you're listening on Talk Film Society, you might listen to all the other great shows that are here on the network. And you can also dig into the archives and our Podbean feed uh, for the earlier episodes here, or the old Double Edge Double Bill stuff is all there. And if nothing else, if you can't, you know, support us monetarily for that $1 for the Patreon, it's cool. Money can be tight for people. But the free way to help us out is to rate, review, or simply share us all around on uh, the various internet web zones and make the uh, algorithm work in our favor so, you know, we don't uh, disappear into the darkness. <laughs> and uh, we'll just say now our next episode, next time, we'll be talking about our M for Masterpiece, uh, which is going to be the 1988 modern classic uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Great Hell fucking yes. movie. Great We talked about this terrible movie. Now we're going into a fucking... A masterpiece, a I would say. Absolute banger. Um, but that'll be next time. And until then, everybody, just remember that uh, you shouldn't live in Transylvania. No matter how low the rates are <laughs> for rent, it's just it's not a good place to live. Dragons yeah. can get you. It's a walkable city, but like <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna get snatched by one of Dracula's children. <laughs> While you're getting your steps, and you're gonna be <laughs> abducted by Dracula. <laughs>